Well, thank you all very much for coming this evening on this nice uh, London day and night. Um, and I've, what I've been told is it doesn't happen so often, so for you to give up your early evening to come see my photographs is very, uh, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm also very grateful to the Frontline Club for inviting me to give this presentation, um, in particular to uh, Kavita Sharma for all the um, organizational work that she's done. Um, and before I get started, I'd like to thank also my uh, photo agency, Corbis, for their efforts, um, one on my behalf representing my work, and secondly, in inviting uh, many people to attend this evening. I started, my interest in photography began in 1972. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And in many ways, I think my childhood um, was very determinant in uh, the path that I have taken as a, a visual communicator for now these last 35 years. 1972 um, was a time of a lot of turmoil in the United States. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement was raging. The Vietnam War was, was going on. Uh, there was a lot of generational conflict. Um, the feminist movement had, was in full, full flare. And my life, in many ways, was affected by all of these things. Um, I was an obsessive athlete uh, until the age of about 16. The only way that I really knew how to express myself was, was physically. Um, and I had a, a serious knee injury in high school football. Um, my junior year in high school, uh, I was, played linebacker, and um, I was hurt one evening. And while I was in the hospital, um, where I'm from, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Indiana is, uh, for any of you that don't know much of it, and there's no reason why you would particularly, is a relatively conservative state. It's actually one of the most conservative states in, in the United States. Um, traditionally, I came from a family that was not at all conservative. My parents were quite liberal, and um, the, the daily conversations around my household always involved uh, a discussion of world affairs. Um, my father was very passionate about human rights. And there was a lot of talk at home around the dinner table about uh, the idea that, in many ways, the game, the game was rigged for many people um, that were underprivileged or were not from a majority um, uh, uh, background um, in America. I grew up with a, a notion in my household that um, it was important to think about people that had less than, than what one does. Um, and that's always been a, a, a driving force, I think, in my, in my work and my vision. So I'm in the hospital with this knee injury, and my parents bring me a, a book of photographs by the great French photographer Cartier-Bresson. I don't know how they had the good sense to, to even know anything about him at that time. And laying in the hospital, looking at these pictures of what otherwise one might think of as mundane daily life moments, um, looking at the poetry and the, the, the real majesty of his images um, indicated to me in a way that I had never really thought about before how if one would just keep one's eyes and heart open, how many great poetic moments of life there are that we walk by every day. I was frustrated because I, I was going to a high school that was integrated by busing. Um, my high school was 30% black. I thought that was a great thing. I thought the diversity of my student body was a real, a real um, fortunate uh, situation for me and for my life. Um, but I was frustrated because I had a lot of black friends on all the sports teams. Um, but at the end of the day, I would go home to my white middle class suburb, and, and my African American friends would go back to the inner city. And I had a sense that. In many ways, we really didn't know each other. So I bought a camera after seeing this book of pictures by Cartier-Bresson. And I had all this time on my hands that I had never had before. And I started to, every night, drive down to the inner city of my hometown. And the camera became what it has been ever since in many ways for me. It became essentially two or three very important things. One was a pretext and a vehicle for entering worlds where I might not otherwise be welcome. And most importantly, it was an opportunity for me to express myself and, and, and share with others how I felt about uh, the, the, the things and the people and the places that I was discovering. And now, 35 years later, that sort of two-pronged 
uh, approach and, and, and relationship with visual communication is, is a constant. It was a real sort of coming of age, uh, time of coming of age for me. I, I started to every night uh, go to the inner city of my hometown. I was frequenting um, taverns, pool halls, gospel churches, soul dance clubs, um, and people's homes. And I had a great excitement of coming home every night and running down to the basement of my home, of my house after dinner and developing the role of film that I would have shot that day and making prints and running upstairs and showing the, the work to my parents. And I want to underline that point because I think so often people think about photography in terms of cameras and technique and film or digital. And, every, and many times we lose track of the fact that photography is more than anything all about sharing a response to the world with others. The word sharing, I think, is extremely important with the the notion of visual communication. In fact, I think the word sharing is one of the really underused words in, in our modern vocabulary. I finished high school and I went to the University of Michigan and um, my freshman year in college I was really miserable. I, uh, I felt like uh, education seemed to be very disconnected to my notion of, of what was important in life. Um, it, it felt uh, very superfluous that year. I think that's a, something that happens to a lot of people at that age. And I'd been very inspired um, when I first got involved in, in photography by a notion that photography could also uh, contribute um, a form of public service, of informing people things about society and, and, and life and the environment they lived in, um, and, and to underline often notions of, of, of injustice and oppression. Um, I was very inspired by some of the photographers of the early tw American 20th century, like Jacob Rees, Louis Hine. I was very inspired also by the, the work of the Farm Security Administration in the 40s under Roosevelt. This was my high school graduation. So I, I, I back up a second. <coughs> The summer, between my, the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, I, I didn't mention yet that I have an identical twin brother who has been a, a, a very important person in my life. Um, and my twin brother, David, who's also a photographer, developed very early on, a, about a couple months after me, a, a similar passion for photography and, and communicating with pictures. And one summer day, one of us had won a, a National Scholastic Photography Competition, um, and we needed to get the model release of a gentleman, an older man, that was in the pictures for, in order to pick up and collect the prize. And we tracked this guy down to a, a street in the inner city of our hometown called McClellan Street. And that day, while we were talking to him, we noticed and were struck by the fact that every house on this street had a porch on the front, um, there was a lot, even though it was a very working class, blue collar, blue collar street, there was a lot of life on this street. People yelled back and forth across the porches to each other. There were a lot of games being played on the street. Doors seemed wide open. People walked in and out of each other's homes. And my brother and I said to each other that summer day, why don't we spend a year photographing this one three block long street? So we started immediately doing that and we would go back and forth to the street four or five times a week and we would, always take people, we would always take photographs back to the people we photographed. And so very quickly, we, be, we became sort of fixtures on the street. They looked forward to having us come. And, and while one of us, we, in the beginning, we only had one camera. And while one of us was taking pictures, the other one would be babysitting for people's kids or playing games. And by the end of that year, every family on the street had essentially a family album of our photographs. I'm excited um, to say that 35 years later, Next fall, uh, a book of these images called McCollin Street will be uh, published in, in September by Indiana University Press. This was a blind man. Um, I always had the impression that he could see, and this was his son, not his grandson.
So I went to college in my freshman year at the, at the winter break. I went back to my hometown and I, I met the mayor and I said that I, I was, as I mentioned earlier, I was really miserable in school and I, I said to the mayor that they ought to hire me as a photographer for the Urban Affairs Department and allow me to photograph themes of life in my hometown related to public policy um, so people would become aware of the, the things that the public policy makers in my hometown were involved in. And the mayor liked the idea. I got a job working for the Urban Affairs Department of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I, I would commute back and forth from the University of Michigan four days a week. I would be in Fort Wayne photographing three days in school. At the end of my sophomore year of college, after having done that for a year, a woman that worked for that city government um, had moved out to California. And there were a lot of really interesting people that were working in that very provincial uh, conservative um, region, but happened to be a very enlightened city government at the time under this mayor. And this woman who'd moved out to California sent me a, a letter at the end of my sophomore year of college that was sort of a dream come true. It was like a gift dropping from the sky. She, asked, she said she had taken a job working for the Office of Economic Opportunity in California and wanted to know if I would be willing to come out to California and spend four months driving up and down the state with just enough money to play for flea bag hotels and, and diners and gas money and to do a photo documentary on poverty and that they would, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity would exhibit my photographs in community centers around the state. So I went out to California that summer with my then college sweetheart who was, wanted to be a writer. And the two of us drove up and down the state of California for four months. And we were given statistics about pockets of poverty, but anyone we met were people that we discovered on our own. And during those four months, my life had such a sense of purpose. Um, and it was really one of the most exciting four months of my life. I, would, I was photographing. My friend was writing stories about the people we met. And it was a real... It was a real sort of time of opening up my heart and, and my eyes to the world and, and a time of discovery. It was the first time actually for me to leave the Midwest. One of my favorite books when I was growing up was a book by a writer named Claude Brown called Man Child in the Promised Land. And I always thought that was such a, a, an appropriate title for this young man. This was a woman who sold blood daily for, to pay for her food. I've always been struck by the body language of people. And I, I feel that, that photography is essentially a process not only of responding, but of observing. Just a, a quick point that I, I'd like to make, I'm very passionate about the notion of, of photography being what I like to call visual communication. And I don't think that photographs have to implicitly be at the service of any other medium of, of, of communication. I think photography can be its own fully embodied element of, of communication and doesn't have to be a service industry to words, doesn't have to illustrate text, doesn't have to underline headlines. Photographs can speak on their own, and the way that photographs link together can create a discussion, can open up questioning, can communicate texture, impart impulse and, and ideas. And I think one of the things that has happened in our world today is that too often we get these very simplistic responses to the world from public policymakers, world leaders about the world, a world that actually, as we know, is very chaotic and often where the truth lays very much in the gray area, not in the, the black and white simplistic answers and responses that we're often fed. And I think photography is a tremendous medium of communication for dealing with notions of texture and grayness. 1975, after coming back from that summer in California, my then girlfriend Karen got a... a scholarship to, to go to France to learn French. And I started my junior year at college, and I, I again, I, I absolutely hated it. I'd saved some money with some summer jobs. I dropped out of college, and I 
took a plane to Paris in the, in the fall of 1975. When I arrived in Paris, um, this young guy that was then, uh, I believe, 18 years old, who had really never, I'd never been anywhere outside the United States, I'd barely been anywhere in the United States, and arriving in Paris was literally, and hearing the French language was all like music to my ears and, and really music to my heart. 1975 France was a very exciting time, a, a place where there was a real plurality of, of ideas, ideology. There was no consensus. The country was split down the middle 50-50 between the right and the left. The Communist Party in France in 1975 had 12 to 14 percent of the population voting for it. And this was a, 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 such a, an opening for me to, to be in Europe, to be around the, not only the beauty of the city, the style of the people, to be encountering people from so many other places around the world and to be having a direct connection to, to world history as opposed to only reading about it. Things began to make sense to me in a new way. The Iron Curtain was only hours away, um, splitting East and West Europe at that time. It was the height of the Cold War. Many of the photographers whose work had most inspired me were, were nearby. The, the photo agencies in France were extremely dynamic at that time. Um, and so it was a scene that was all very ex exciting for me. When I arrived in Paris, I imposed upon myself a, a photo project of uh, photographing the old cafes of the 4th arrondissement of Paris, Le Marais. And every afternoon after my French classes at the Sorbonne, I would go to these cafes and, and spend time photographing the people. And I, I found that I was learning French about a hundred times faster than any of my classmates because in order to make photographs of people, I had to talk to them. I finally found something academically that I was, that I was in love with, which was the French language. I, after living in France for eight months, I went back and finished my, my university at the University of Michigan and, and majored in French literature. And I actually really began to apply myself as a student. And I had a singular passion, and that was to go back to France. I didn't have a grand plan. I just wanted to offer myself at least one year there. I'd met a lot of Americans while I had been in, while I had been in Paris um, on the early days that had this sort of idea of becoming the next Hemingway. And, and I noticed that many times they would run out of money after about three weeks or a month and would um, end up going back to the States fairly quickly. And I didn't want that to happen to myself. So one of the things that I did that I think as I look back at my life, that was maybe one of the most intelligent things I ever did was after graduating from college, I moved back to Indiana and I got a job working on a highway road crew doing manual labor, building concrete highways. The people, it was a rough job. It was tough, very physical. Most of the people I worked with had a gun in their car. It was a real, again, kind of a coming of age for me and I found it both socially and, and, um, and physically interesting and exciting. And I saved every penny I made for a year. I lived at home, had my room and board paid for. <clears throat> in 1978, I moved back to Paris with $20,000 in my pocket, which was a lot of money back then. And I worked as a printer in a photo lab called Picto, where Cartier-Bresson's prints are made, and many of the great Magnum photographers' work was printed there. I knew I didn't want to be a printer all my life, but I had never studied photography, and I thought that this would be in itself a very good education. After doing that job for about three months, I discovered that there was a, a school called the Institute of Political Science in Paris, Sciences Politiques, where actually the, the new French president, Sarkozy, went to school and happened to have been a classmate of mine about 27 years ago. And I enrolled in this school and, and did a three-year degree in international relations and really got involved in, in studying world history and political science. And suddenly, being in Paris and studying political science and world history and, and being in a place where the affairs of the world were so nearby with the, the, the Cold War at, at its peak, um, my studies were very exciting. And daily I would take pictures of Paris going to and from classes and I worked mornings at the photo lab and then I would do my, my studies in the afternoon and the evening and I did that for three years. After three years, when I graduated, 
I, I wanted to stay in Europe. I didn't know how I was going to manage that. I thought about entering the American Diplomatic Corps. Uh, I did very poorly on the entrance exam, um, particularly on the English language part. I'd been studying in French for four years. Um, I, I thought about going to law school. I, I did pretty poorly on the entrance exam for the law board uh, in America. Um, and what I really knew I wanted to do was be a photographer. And one day, I just looked in the phone book for the phone number of the great French photographer Robert Doineau, whose work had always really moved me. And I didn't really want anything from him. I just wanted to be touched by his spirit. I wanted to meet him. I'd made a point all my, since I started photography, trying to meet the people that really meant something to me in terms of the way that they made pictures and the way they correspond, the way they communicated with images. And I met Doineau about before a, a, a exhibition opening. And we spoke for 45 minutes before he ever looked at one of my pictures of Paris. And he asked me lots of things about myself. And I think he was very interested that I had chosen to go to this school of political science. And after about 45 minutes and then looking at my images, he asked me if I would like to be his assistant and if he, I would like him to introduce me to the director of his photo agency, Rafa, which was one of the, the, the best French photo agencies at that time. And he, Maybe many of you are familiar with names of the great humanistic French school of photography like Willie Ronis, Brassai, Sabine Weiss, um, Duano, uh, Janine Yeps, um, and on and on. And I said yes to both things. And I began to, more, on a daily basis, go to Duano's apartment on the outskirts of Paris and print his photographs. And I started to get freelance photo assignments from many of the top American magazines like Time and Newsweek and many of the French magazines. And in 1984, I had a big break. Um, I was sent out to Normandy to photograph the 40th anniversary of D-Day for Newsweek. And while I was out there working with a journalist, I, my challenge was to meet as many people that had lived D-Day themselves, pe French people living on the, the coast, English soldiers, American veterans, Canadians, Australians, and, 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 Fr and German soldiers um, that had actually been on the Normandy coast the day of D-Day. And this was a really exciting photo story, and, and it really connected to uh, uh, a sense of world history that I was already very interested in, he hearing people's living stories. And Newsweek ended up doing a cover and publishing, I think, nine or ten pages of my pictures. And this was a big break. And Newsweek then offered me an annual contract. And this was the beginning of the next 18 to 20 years of my life that were a sort of dream come true in many ways for someone who wants to be a photojournalist, um, where my daily life involved, I was based in Paris, and my daily life involved waking up every morning, reading three, four newspapers a day, um, listening to the, the BBC on the hour, and people often think that photojournalists are dispatched by a publication. Well, that was never the way that it worked with my relationship with Newsweek. I, I, was, I would read newspapers and listen to the radio, and I was always the one that made the call first. And I, it was a very gratifying relationship. Um, I would call the foreign photo editor of Newsweek, and, and for example, I might have seen in the newspaper that people were demonstrating on Monday night in Leipzig, East Germany, and I would call and say, you know, this is a really new thing, and, and, and it's important, and it's an important evolution of the way things are going in Eastern Europe, and I think we ought to be there. And, and often enough, the, f the foreign photo editor would say, go. And many days, I would have, I was my own producer, my own researcher, and many days I would have, I would make my own plane reservations for maybe two or three de destinations. I can remember times when I had a, a reservation for Johannesburg, uh, Moscow, and Tokyo all the same day, and I didn't know where I was going to be that night, and I didn't know where I was actually going to decide to go until things kind of panned out later in the day. My life as a photojournalist working for Newsweek all those years, <clears throat> even though many of the assignments were relatively short-term assignments, um, often assignments that would be of duration from maybe a week to a month, but in spite of that, Often enough, they were themes and stories that were long-term in nature that I kept coming back to. I covered the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from 1988 to the present time. 
I had a, an accreditation as Newsweek's photographer in Moscow. And starting in 1986, I sort of became not only a, a Soviet specialist, but a Gorbachev specialist. And during the whole Gorbachev regime, any time he would travel overseas, I would follow him. And I, it was an extremely exciting time, and it was an incredible opportunity to have this multiple entry visa that would, allow, that would allow me to fly in and out of the Soviet Union, a place where it was very difficult for Western correspondents to have access to unless you were based there. It was very difficult to get a visa. So during those years, I, I witnessed the, the, the transformation of the, the Soviet state to uh, a more open society starting in 1991. And it began to be the, the unraveling of the, the Eastern Bloc and, the, in many ways, the, the unraveling of the Iron Curtain. This was a photograph that was made in the summer of 1989 when many East Germans were going to Budapest, ostensibly on vacation. And then they would go to the border between Hungary, Hungary and, and Austria and sneak over the border. And this was happening by the, the hundreds, if not thousands. This particular photograph was a, a photograph that was made with a Newsweek correspondent, um, Rob Nordland and I, when we went to the, the border of Hungary and Austria one night. And we met up with a, what was called a passer and two young East German boys who had come from Berlin, East Berlin and they wanted to flee across the border. And so about 4 o'clock in the morning, we, we crawled with these boys for about four hours until we got to this place where you see this watchtower, and there was another watchtower on the other side. It wasn't necessarily a, 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 an entirely safe journey. The, the Hungarian border guards had, had shot and, and injured and I believe killed some refugees the week before. And just about the time that we had crossed this line into these corn stalks, um, we thought that we were we thought we were in Austria, and I was a little hesitant. I said I thought we probably should continue to crawl for a while and make sure. But the two boys thought that they were in Austria, and they, and they jumped up. And all of a sudden, several Hungarian border guards jumped out of some bushes, and they had guns, and they told us to stop. Well, my heart was broken for these two guys. And I could see suddenly that just in the very short distance, about 10 yards away, was a wire. And I, and I understood that this was the the actual border with Hungary and Austria. And I, and I thought that I would confuse the situation, and so I took out my American passport and immediately approached the Hungarian border guards thinking that they would be very confused with an American passport. And as they were fumbling with my passport and talking to each other in German, I was standing next to one of the two boys. The, uh, there were, one was very tall, one was very broad, built like a refrigerator. And the one standing next to me I took my fist and I slammed it into his thigh and I said, go. And like a deer in flight, the boy took three steps and was over this wire. And the Hungarian border guards are fumbling with their guns and their German shepherds are barking. And I didn't think they were going to shoot. And so I said to the other boy, go, run, run. And the other boy froze. He was petrified. And I said it was a moment of, of incredible power in some ways where the what I thought the destiny of two boys suddenly had grown up to each other was in a, in a split second um, altered, where one was free in the West and the other was going to go back to prison and eventually be deported back to Berlin. Well, little, little did I know that three days later, the actual Austrian-Hungarian border dropped and for the first time, East Germans could freely go to the West. And I think that that day, actually, when the Hungarian East the Hungarian-Austrian border dropped was truly the end of the, the East German state. Um, people always talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall, but I actually think it was the day in that summer of 1989 that the Austrian-Hungarian border dropped. It was one of the real key opening days of, of the Eastern Bloc. 1989 was an incredibly dense year for a photojournalist. Um, Tiananmen Square in China happened. All the revolutions in Eastern Europe, the Berlin Wall fell, the Velvet Revolution in Prague, Ceausescu was overthrown in Romania, and the life of a photojournalist covering those kinds of things was, 
was an amazing roller coaster that, that year of 1989 where one's life was just almost every week thrown into the middle of a moment of really significant world history. Um, and I think that anyone that is interested in, in photographing world affairs, news, the way that events affect not only a society, but the lives of individuals, nothing could be more exciting and, and more meaningful and powerful than, than the kinds of events that, that we saw in 1989. It was the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa. It wasn't long until Nelson Mandela would walk out of 27 years of prison. Tiananmen Square, China. This was the morning after the Tiananmen Square massacre, June 6, 1989. This was a, a woman that had just discovered her son in a morgue who was killed that night. This was the, the cover of Newsweek. Tiananmen Square was one of the events that I covered that probably in many ways left the biggest imprint in terms of, of how, I, how I felt emotionally and, and, and maybe in some ways the sort of real difficult challenge of, of grappling with, with the kinds of things that, that one sees. The, the spirit of students in China standing up and, and asking for a, simply a, a relatively unsophisticated demand of simply a better life, more democracy, and seeing that spirit after two months of being there and, and day in, day out, witnessing the spirit of, of those literally millions of students and then seeing it crushed by military hardware really set me back for a while. It, it, I remember coming back to Paris after Tiananmen Square and, and really bouncing off the walls of my apartment for a few weeks and, and often finding myself in tears and, and having a real kind of new sense of my own mortality. I remember thinking to myself, when you grow up in the States, there's this often this sort of sense that I, I think is probably not very true that, that life is a construction and you can kind of make what you want out of it and opportunity is endless. And this was the first time in my life, I suppose, when I really had a sense that maybe in my own lifetime, the life of people maybe wasn't going to change some significantly. Maybe things weren't going to really necessarily be different. A coup in Moscow, 1993. Um, rebel soldiers um, had taken over the, the Russian White House. Extremely violent uh, situation, two or three I believe three correspondents, uh, colleagues of mine, were killed the night before I made this picture laying right next to me in front of the, the, the television station in Moscow. This was the morning after Nelson Mandela walked out of 27 years of prison. This was in the, his backyard in Soweto, South Africa. My life in the 90s became very tied into many social, man-made and natural disasters in Africa. I covered, the, I covered the famine in Somalia in 1992. This was a time, I would say, when in spite of the incredibly devastating pain and frustration of seeing people literally by the hundreds a day die of starvation, that I did have some sense that imagery could really have an impact, could really make a difference. Um, I have no pretension or sense that my images on their own made any particular difference, but I did have a sense in 1992 that imagery in a collective way had had some direct effect on food eventually making its way to Somalia. This was after the genocide in Rwanda on the Zaire-Rwandan border. Rwanda, 1994. The quantity of death in Rwanda was more than one's mind could actually comprehend. Something that would be difficult to actually imagine would be for anyone that was there on that border of Zaire and, and Rwanda after the massive exodus of, of Hutu refugees, of which about 100,000 or more died of cholera in a two-week period. It would be if you would imagine walking down a street in London and everywhere you looked was a body on the sidewalk. And many times, several bodies stacked up. And that's what life looked like on the border of Zaire and Rwanda in, at that time. 
I began to cover a lot more conflict in the 90s. My life became involved implicitly in most of the world's wars. This was in Grozny in Chechnya. Kabul, Afghanistan, 1996. This was on the Kosovar Albanian border. A Kosovar Albanian man that had been told that his wife and children had been killed by the Serbs and been forced into exile, forced to walk across the border into Albania. I, I afterwards went back because I was haunted by this image. This was a picture that was on the cover of Newsweek. But I needed to know what had actually happened to this man and his family. And six months later, I went back to Kosovo and discovered that ultimately it was a happy story, that this man had come home and discovered his children and his wife alive. And it was a time in my life when I made a little bit of a, a change. I had been working for Newsweek for many years at this point, extremely grateful for the opportunities that that work offered myself. But I began to be a little frustrated that I had a sense that sometimes maybe even my own imagery or the way that images were used could be a little formulaic. And I had a sense that some of the, as I mentioned earlier, that some of the, the more chaotic things that I was feeling, the sort of chaotic sense of texture and, and gray area that couldn't be easily summed up in, in an image, that, that moments when you tried to make the sky parallel to the ground and line things up in a balanced kind of classical way, a way that pictures were often used and published in American news magazines, that that didn't really correspond to the truth of what I was feeling. And so not only did I at that point begin to experiment a little bit with the way that I was framing pictures and even allow a little bit more chaos to come into my imagery, but I also decided that it was a good time to try to empower myself and my voice with what modern technology offered. And so I bought a, a, a high, a, a three chip DV video camera when I went to Kosovo. And I, I, still photography was still my priority, but I thought of stills often as kind of like a peak mode of action, like a jump shot when you let in basketball, the moment when you let go of the ball, but leading up to that moment, and then following that moment, there was a lot of inter interesting information. So during that, time in Kosovo, while I was waiting for those peak moments of, of imagery to take place, I did video sequences. And with that image that I, show, I showed you earlier of the man with the two children that had been the, the cover of Newsweek, I ended up splicing together the, my still images and the videography and the sound, and I did a 14-minute piece for Nightline. And it was really, and I mention this because I think we live in a time that's really different in many ways than than the way that one thought about communication maybe even 15 years ago, where one doesn't have to be relegated to being a correspondent, a producer, a photographer, a cameraman. But technology today offers an individual like ourselves to empower our voice with many different means of technology. And we can do many things at once. And I think it's, while often people speak about the frustrations and the death of photojournalism. In many ways, I'm actually really encouraged. I think with the internet today, and I also think that with the photo agency world and the reach that many of the, 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 the photo agencies like Corbis today offer a photographer's voice and imagery with a real worldwide reach, that in many ways, an individual's voice is more empowered than ever before. Haiti. Siberia, as much as I've been interested in moments of human drama, I've also always been drawn to the quiet daily lives of moments of life. And I've always had the sense that if there was anything that could justify my shouting about what was wrong with the world, it was the fact that there are so many beautiful and wonderful things about life. And I've always wanted as much as screaming with images about the things that, that make me unhappy and about injustice and oppression, I've, I've wanted to try and underline beauty and, and poetry with images as well. And I think that my own life as a photographer 
is flourishes and is like a plant with water in many ways by having a balance. Eritrea. Leipzig, East Germany. A ballerina at the Bolshoi, Bolshoi in Moscow. Soweto, South Africa. A Romanian gypsy. Rural China. A Pope's visit to, cast to Cuba. Aside from one of the, the components of my life as a photojournalist, aside from photographing social issues and the economic development and, and plight of countries and, and social and political change, my life has also been very much plugged into, on occasion, following world leaders. And one of the real challenges, I think, for a visual communicator is to go beyond the sort of manipulated, staged press moments that are often offered to photographers and to correspondents in political campaigns and in, in the lives of political figures. This was Colin Paul in Moscow, 1988. And I think one of the real challenges is to try to get underneath the skin of people we know and to, and to communicate to others something real about them as people, something more than what is simply projected um, as a public relations ploy, but really trying to get at the people that, that in many ways run the world, at, at something about their soul and their spirit. And I've always found it very rewarding and challenging, the approach of trying to be a fly on the wall and get to know someone enough that they would allow you to be around them and simply get them to forget you and, and let them be who they really are. I was grateful to have that opportunity with some of the prominent world leaders of these last years. I had a very close relationship with Gerhard Schroeder. It was kind of ironic, but even though I don't speak a word of, world of, a word of German, I was one of the few photographers that he really trusted close by and near him. And I, I covered very up close and personal both of his major campaigns um, as Chancellor of, of Germany. <clears throat> I was in Scotland doing a, a story on devolution. Um, and I had gone to dinner with a, a colleague of mine in a hotel in um, in Edinburgh and after dinner I was tired and I was laying in my hotel bed and I had this television and I had the BBC on and I was kind of one of those moments where my eyes was sort of half open and I was kind of half awake half asleep and I heard the announcer kind of in this half awake state say um, Lady Diana the Princess Wales has been involved in a serious car accident in Paris and I woke up immediately like an, ele like an electric rod and I, I watched on television as the correspondents began to talk about the, the photographers chasing Diana through the streets of Paris. And the, the tone of voice was so accusatory. And these were, I knew that these were Paris photographers, many of which I knew as some of them friends and, and at least colleagues. And it was very upsetting to, to hear of photography and photographers being portrayed this way. And I also, of course, I was working for Newsweek and I, and, and, I knew that this was a very important moment of, of at least history. I had never been a paparazzi. I had never chased stars or, or, or stood outside of restaurants. But I didn't have a disdain for that kind of work. I certainly had an understanding that if people do that kind of work, it's because someone buys the newspapers and magazines that publish those kinds of images. But in any case, Diana's death and her funeral, to me, was not about chasing a star, but it was about a moment in time and a moment in history. And I, the next morning I flew back to Paris and I, I photographed Diana's casket being taken out of the Paris hospital and accompanied by Prince Charles. And then I flew over to London. And I speak about this because I happen to be in London tonight 
Actually, the last time I was in London, as I realized today, coming over on the Eurostar was for Diana's funeral several years ago. And I remember not only the, the atmosphere of, of London and, and the world at that time um, and the incredible outpouring of emotion for, for her and her life, but I also remember how angry people were at photography and photographers and sometimes going to places like Chen Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace and having people say really nasty things to, to me about being a photographer. And it was a trying time. This was the cover of Newsweek, um, the day of Diana's funeral. I was in a hotel here in London the night of Diana's funeral after I discovered that my picture was going to be on the cover and I was tired and it had been an emotional day. And I got a call from my photo editor in New York telling me that Mother Teresa had just died and wanted to know if I would be willing to fly to Calcutta for her funeral. And I said, of course. And so I flew the next day to Calcutta. And I look back at that time as a really amazing you know, juxtaposition of, of, of two weeks of, of two very important women, and yet how different their lives were, and, and, and at the same time, things that they had in common, and how different their funerals were, and how different the, the countries and societies in which they lived were. And it was kind of a a real surreal juxtaposition and the kind of thing that I think often a photographer and a photojournalist's life is involved in, these kind of really surreal juxtapositions of, of many different impulses in a very short period of time. This photograph was made on September 12th at 6.30 in the morning. I spent the night of September 11th at Ground Zero. I was one of the few photographers at Ground Zero that night. I had hid in an office building that had blown out, blown out windows looking right over Ground Zero. And I sat there by myself the whole night of September 11th. And I was really blown away as I saw how many people that night, and I'm not talking about many days after where suddenly it became kind of a, a known thing to want to be heroic and go be helpful, but I'm talking about in the first hours of September 11th after the buildings came down, the number of people that I saw crane operators, um, construction workers, firemen, nurses that had husbands, wives, children, bills to pay, but yet with the decency of their heart had, had come to ground zero in really dangerous environment with the smoke and things falling down and that were offering what they knew how to do with their life's work to try to make a difference. And, and it gave me a real, even in, in spite of the, the tragedy of that day, those gestures filled my heart and my chest with a sense of, of the potential of human decency. This was a man who had lost one of his best friends, a fireman, and he had that, that stare, that thousand yard stare that people often talk about in war where people have seen or experienced something and their life will be different forever. Just a quick anecdote, this man's name is, is, a, is Salvatore Isabella, and after this picture was published, about a year later, I got an email from a woman saying that she was this man's wife, I'm sorry, girlfriend, and that she had seen my picture published and she was very grateful because Sal had never been able to tell anybody where he was the night of September 11th and what he had done, and that my photograph was the only indication and proof of where he had been, and she wanted to know if I would send him a photograph. And I said, of course, I send them a photograph. And I said, I would. Well, I forgot about it. I had full intention of sending it. And about six months later, I got another email telling me that the woman was very sad because they had broken up, but she said it would really still mean a lot to her to receive this photograph. And would I please send it? And I said, of course, I responded saying, of course, I would. I went off on a trip, full intention of sending the photograph, again forgot. And about a month before the anniversary of September 11th, about a year ago, I got another email from the woman saying, Peter, I have happy news. Sal and I have gotten married, and we would still really like to have that photograph. <laughs> so I picked up the phone because she'd left a phone number, and I, I called immediately, and I, I said, um, I'm gonna, of course I'm going to send you the photograph, and I'm so happy to hear that things have worked out for the two of you. But I've always wanted to know what Sal was thinking about when I made that photograph. And she said to me, well, Sal's right here, right next to me, but 
I really don't think he's going to be able to tell you because he's never been able to speak about that evening to anyone. And I said, well, would you mind if I spoke to Sal? And she said, well, just a second. And there was a minute, a second of silence, and um, a voice on the other end said, uh, hello, Peter. And I said, hi, Sal. And suddenly all I could hear were tears on the end of the phone. I heard a man sobbing, and I... And we didn't speak for probably several minutes. And finally, Sal said, uh, you know, Peter, I'm really grateful for that photograph. I've never really been able to talk about what happened. One of my best friends, um, I, I looked for him all night that night, and I couldn't find him. And I've always felt so bad about it. And um, I said, Sal, I want you to know you're a good man. And I knew that Sal, had, his wife had told me that he rides a Harley Davidson, and I've done a lot of photographs of Harley Davidson rallies. And so we started to talk about Harleys, and, uh, and the spirit of the conversation changed. And, and um, a week before the latest anniversary of 9-11, of, uh, I got a call from Sal asking if I would join him in a pub to spend the anniversary together. Unfortunately, I was traveling overseas. But I, I recount this story because... One of the real beautiful things that happens to photographers is the opportunity to really connect and to be touched by people's life experience. The Pope's funeral in Rome. Soldiers training to go to Iraq. 1991, I had been in the, the Gulf for a couple months before the beginning of the first Gulf War. I made a real difficult decision. About a month before the ground war began, the military had more or less sent a, a, a clear message that there was going to be a long air war before the ground war began. And I didn't feel comfortable with the pool system that photographers and journalists were being asked to be a part of. And so I made a difficult decision that I was not going to participate in the pools. And I went back to, I took the last plane, the last commercial flight out of the Gulf region before the air war began in 1991. And my plan was I had a, a, a new Saudi visa in my, in my passport. And my plan was is that I was going to, as soon as the ground war started, I was going to come back and I was going to cover the Gulf War, the ground war, unilaterally as an independent photographer, not as a member of a pool. It was a difficult decision. I was used to being where the action was. And, and during that month, I, I was in Paris. And when finally the ground war began, no one could know that it was going to be such a quick war, that it was only going to last four or five days. I immediately flew to Riyadh, landed in Riyadh, the on the night of the, one of the first nights of the ground war. And I drove, I, I drove all night long with a French colleague. And we got to Kuwait City just shortly after the Iraqi troops were fleeing Kuwait City on their way back to, ba way back to Baghdad. That night, several French colleagues and other journalists started to filter into a, a hotel that had been closed throughout the war. And we all, we found a manager that opened rooms for us and there was no electricity, but we, we all the journalists and photographers began to, to gather in this hotel. And many colleagues told me about this scene that was on the outskirts of, of Kuwait City, a scene that went on to be called the, the Mile of Death. So the next morning I woke up very early and I was one of the first journalists with a couple colleagues of mine to arrive at this place. And this is the scene that I saw. It was a surreal scene of car engines still turning, wheels turning, radios still playing, and bodies in many directions. What had happened was that a convoy of Iraqi military and civilian cars and vehicles had tried to flee on its way back to Iraq. And the Allied forces, the Allied air forces, with, with satellite radar had picked up this convoy and I, I believe as I understand it for at least a six hour time period went up and down this highway 
First, they had bombed a, a crater in the highway in front of the first vehicle, so no vehicles could advance. And then for six or eight hours, the, the planes went up and down the highway, strafing the vehicles. And this was the, the scene that I saw that morning. And I saw a lot of death. I had no idea how much of it, but I saw it in great numbers. I saw a U.S. graves detail with bulldozers making mass graves, Iraqi prisoners being forced to gather Iraqi dead bodies and throwing them into piles, and then bulldozers would cover them up. And when the war was over, and I left the Gulf region, and I went back to France, and I went back to America, I was very frustrated because I had a sense that the sight and the, the scenes that I had seen were not seen by the world public, were not seen by the American public. And what worried me was not at all any importance of my own political point of view, but a sense of responsibility that if, as people went forward, if they were going to be asked again whether they should support or not support a war, that they had the right to know what war looks like. And it worried, it really worried me that they didn't know, that the way the war had been communicated was the reality was that it had been a very quick war. The U.S. and Western forces had incurred very few casualties. The war, the build-up to the war had been a long period of time, at least eight months. And that in the news cycle, that because this had been a relatively straightforward and quick victory, that the world of journalism was ready to move on. And mo none of these images were ever published. And so just prior to this latest war in Iraq in 2003, I sent a letter to the editor of a, a site on the web called The Digital Journalist. And I, and I said what I just said to you, that I, I felt that it was my responsibility as the public was going to be asked one more time to make a decision whether or not they would support war or not, that it was my responsibility that at least I should do what I could to make sure people knew what war looked like. And we published those images that I just showed you on, on the site The Digital Journalist. And there probably isn't at least a week or a month that goes by, particularly in the early days, when I don't get an email from someone around the world thanking me for communicating those images of war. And I think that it really is the responsibility, whether it's painful to look at or not, that not only do journalists and photographers and photojournalists show the realities of the world, but I also think that it's very important that people be obliged to see them. I went back to Iraq in 2003. Again, I decided not to be a member of the pool system. I worked as an independent photographer. I entered Iraq from Kuwait in the area of Basra, mostly in the, the sector where the English forces were and have been. And I spent two months in southern Iraq. And I felt like knowing that there were many journalists that were embedded with U.S. And, and British troops, that maybe my responsibility was also to communicate what was happening to the Iraqi people and giving a sense of how the war was touching Iraqis. And something that I think that people probably, maybe it's not intuitive, and that is, but it's something I think important to think about when you think about this pool system of journalism, and that is that when you wear the uniform of a country as a, as a journalist or a photographer, that on the battlefield people think of you, they, they don't make a difference. You're, you're assimilated with, with soldiers. And as the, you're, you're obliged, you have a sort of form of contract with the unit you're with, and you're obliged, you're obliged to keep moving forward with them. And there's no time to linger on the battlefield and to go to hospitals and to speak to the, the citizens of a country and to ask them how the war and battle has affected them. Not only do you not have the time to, but it would be too dangerous. You're wearing a military uniform. And I think it's essential that there be independent journalists that do this kind of work. And I think one of the real tragedies of the war in Iraq, not only is the tragedy, obviously, for the Iraqi people and the number of Iraqi victims on a daily basis and the soldiers that are there, and the people that are coming not only dying, but the people that are coming back wounded and that will suffer for the rest of their lives one way or the other. But I think also one of the real tragedies 
is that I think that the world public doesn't have an opportunity to adequately see how this war is affecting the Iraqi people on a daily basis. It has simply been become almost too dangerous for journalists to work independently and to not be embedded with troops today. I take me, this takes me to the last segment of my presentation. When I came back from Iraq in 2003, after being there for two months, I was one more time a bit disillusioned. One more time I had the distinct impression that the war that I saw was not the war that the, certainly the American public was seeing and most of the people in the West. Whereas on a daily basis, I went into Iraq on the first day of the war with the first tanks that entered the country. And I, not only did I not see people jumping for joy, what I saw in the eyes, and I'm, I tried to cut it down the middle and be as honest as I could, and my honest response to what I saw was that in the eyes of the people standing on the sides of the road as I went into Iraq, what I saw at best was mistrust and at worst aggressive hostility. And unlike the images that the Western public saw of the Saddam statue coming down in Baghdad and, and what we know now to have been more or less a rent -a crowd and a, and a statue that had been essentially pulled down by a, a U.S. special ops group that had literally put the, the lasso around the, the Saddam's neck, what I saw was on a daily basis the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people already being lost. I saw forces blasting forward towards Baghdad and there being a complete vacuum of, of control and power left behind, a country that had no, had had no democracy and had no democratic rule for X number of years until that time, and suddenly a world of lawlessness being left behind and a, and a world also with no food and water, no electricity. And I said to myself immediately, that it looked to me like this was a program gone wrong. Whether it could have ever been a program that, gone, that would go right, I didn't know. But it didn't take two years. It didn't take four years. It didn't take five years for me to see that this was a program gone wrong. I remember, and I don't say this with any sense of, of, of self-congratulations, but only honesty. I remember standing outside of a hospital after the, the Western forces had entered Baghdad and I saw a scene of pandemonium of Iraqi people screaming and shouting and, and angry because the hospital had no anesthesia, had no clean instruments. People were laying in puddles of blood on the floor. This was not four years later. This was two months after the beginning of the war. And I remember seeing a, a Western journalist say to one of the American soldiers who was just out of control and, and, and almost hysterical with despair, I remember one of the a journalist saying to this person, don't worry, it's going to be all right. And I remember myself and a colleague said, no, it's not going to be all right. And I don't think we have to look too far to, to doesn't take a lot to agree that things aren't all right and they haven't been all right. And when I came back in 2003 with this sense of disillusionment that one more time, particularly Americans, and I would, I would say probably the British as well, had not seen the war that I saw, I was standing in a waiting room in the Charles de Gaulle airport waiting for a flight and I saw a very dapper, man, dapper dressed man, very elegant, good looking guy, elder man and I'm a pretty gregarious guy when I want to meet people and I walked right up to him and I said, who are you? And he said his name was Lewis Lapham, the editor of Harper's Magazine. And I didn't know a lot about Harper's, I actually hadn't read it but it rang to me of being what I knew about it as being a, a, a very good magazine, a magazine of good thinkers and, and an honest and a sincere magazine of very good writing. And so I said to this man, I said, I just came back from Iraq and it seems to me one more time I, I saw a war that the public hasn't seen. And he said, well, I want you to tell me more about that. And I said, well, rather than telling you about it, I, I think I could show it to you better. I have a, actually, I have a portfolio of pictures on my, on my computer. And he said, well, great. Come and find me on the flight and let's talk. So I met him in the middle of the plane during the flight and for about I would say at least an hour or two we talked about the war in Iraq and world affairs and just talked about this and that and before we got to New York he said Peter I want you to come see me I want to talk to you about how we could work together well when I got home that night after that flight 
things came up, I had to go away, and I sort of forgot about that conversation until about six months later. And one day I sent Louis Lapham an email and, and said I had really enjoyed meeting him and I wanted to, him to take a look at a website that I had just created. And I got an email about five minutes later saying, Peter, can you meet me for a drink this evening? And I, I said, yes. And we met downtown New York. And when I walked in, he said, Peter, I think there are two ways that we could work together. He said, either I could send you out with one of our best writers and the two of you could do a story together, or I could, cre I could treat you like an author with photographs and you will speak with pictures. And I said, well, Mr. Lapham, in all due respect, the I would do both. I appreciate both opportunities, but the first is sort of business in as usual in journalism. And I said, the second is music to my ears. And he said, well, forget we've ever spoken about the first. And he offered me an annual contract to do three or four stories a year, at that, the first year quarterly, the, the next two years, and, and still today, every four months. And so for the last three years now, I've had this amazing opportunity of every three or four months of having eight pages in Harper's Magazine at a time when many people are, are in a realistic way feeling down about fewer and fewer opportunities for pictures to be seen at a time when the likes of Life Magazine have died. This is a magazine that not only before did it almost never use photographs or certainly not use them as photo, photo essays, now lets a photographer speak with eight pages of pictures with almost no words at all. So these next stories that I'm showing you are some of the photo essays that I've done for Harper's. Photo essays where there's generally only a title and very short cut lines and where layout and the way that images juxtapose against each other are very important. And I've been really enthralled and excited by the opportunity to let pictures speak and the opportunity to put pictures together and to try to create a narrative with images where two and two can make five, where linkages of visual representations, thematic representations can play off each other and say something. I feel like many of the things that are happening in our world today, often involving conflict like the war in Bosnia, the war in Kosovo, the war in Chechnya, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, that often the real truth is not found in the simplistic portrayal of, of life, but in, as I said earlier, often in the chaos, in the gray area. And I think that photography is a medium that can really deal well with texture. And my feeling is, is that, you know, there's often this sense that, particularly in America, there's this, I think, really misguided sense. I'm from the heartland of America. I grew up in Indiana, as I told you earlier. And I think too often there's a sense that, that out there in the heartland of America and places like that, that people are bumbling idiots that don't have, you know, the ability or the desire to really sort through difficult concepts. And often they're fed in the world of communications and in journalism, I think, these really sort of simplistic, and particularly, I would say, more importantly, by, by policymakers, people are, are fed these very simplistic scenarios. And I've always had a sense, and this is something I'm quite passionate about, is that if you would like somebody sitting on a sofa in Iowa to be able to grapple with something that's difficult, then you've got to allow them a chance to digest it and to feel it. But I'm convinced that if they have that chance, that people everywhere that can often make pretty smart and intelligent responses to the world. And so we owe them that opportunity to know what's going on. We often hear about the, the notion of objectivity in journalism. I don't know what that means. I know what fairness is. I know what honesty is. I don't know what objectivity is. Anytime one opens one mouth, one's mouth and one emits a word, it's a choice. Anytime you put pen to paper, the words you choose is a choice. 
everything is, these are subjective choices. I believe entirely in the right for a communicator to have a point of view. What I think is important is that one be honest about it and be fair and balanced. But I think far too often in journalism, one, people hide behind this notion of objectivity with actually, in fact, often enough a, a relatively distinct agenda. I believe in the right for visual communicators, just like written communicators, to in some ways to be a columnist, to, to impart a point of view. And I've taken advantage of that opportunity with some of the photo essays that I've done for Harper's. I've had a great opportunity these last several years to often visit American universities and, and places of education around the world. And particularly in, on American college campuses, one thing that has really frustrated me has been my sense of an incredible disconnect between the lives of students and world affairs. This was definitely not the atmosphere that I knew as a a student myself in the in the 70s and it wasn't the atmosphere that I knew when I began photography where it seemed to me with journalists like Woodward and Bernstein that not only was it not only were people like that successful at challenging power and, and asking important questions but often enough the youth of America and the world and journalists themselves had a sense that it was a form of public duty and real patriotism to challenge what is and to ask important questions. And I've been, I've been disappointed and discouraged that I haven't seen enough of that on college campuses uh, among people that are going to go out in many ways and be the, the real ruling class of, of America, if not the world. And so I decided to do a photo essay that essentially juxtaposed two groups of people more or less the same age soldiers leaving for Iraq and students on American elite East Coast college campuses. And so I chose to do a photo essay juxtaposing college graduation ceremonies and departure ceremonies for soldiers leaving for Iraq. Two groups of people involving pageantry, families, but going in very different directions in life. And I had the sense that this was an opportunity and I think it's something that photography and visual communi communication can do very well of opening up a dialogue, opening up questions, provoking discussion.
I went to I went to New Orleans almost immediately when the the disaster struck there, and what I saw I was I went directly to many of you I think remember scenes from the New Orleans Convention Center where people had been stranded for literally days without food and water. And if you remember, there were people like the head of FEMA that was the organization that, that looks over natural disasters in America, saying that these people had been stranded without food and water because the, the public policymakers weren't aware of their plight. Well, we all know that we have satellite, the world today has satellite technology that can read the letter on a license plate in Yemen. And you would like me to believe that, that they couldn't know that there were literally hundreds and thousands of people stranded without food and water at this convention center and places like that in New Orleans. I decided to do a photo essay called The Dispossessed. And my sense was that the real story of Katrina was not about water, but really about poverty and issues of race. Stories that have existed and realities that have been around for a long time, but that often go without discussion. This last summer, I did a photo essay driving the whole length of the U.S.-Mexican border from Brownsville, Texas to the ocean in California. In December, I spent three weeks to a month in Cuba. One thing that seems clear is that no matter how much longer Fidel Castro is going to live, that change is going to take place in Cuba. No one knows what change exactly that's going to be. And that is a, a question of utmost importance for most Cubans today. And I had been to Cuba several times prior to this trip. And what struck me being there on this particular trip recently was the degree of anxiety and confusion and even sometimes despair that many Cubans are feeling because whether one agrees or doesn't agree with the system that has been there for now since the, the, the Cuban Revolution, one thing is it true is that there has been a system that has been in place. And I think something maybe for one to think about. It's like living in the West in whatever societies we live in that even if one agrees or doesn't agree with the societal rules that one live, where one lives, one most often needs to find a way to navigate those rules and they become a kind of code of, of survival. And I think many Cubans today 
their, one of their major concerns is, is that they simply don't know what their code of survival is going to be in their near future. I wanted to show one of, the new, one of the Harper's layouts to show the way that images are used and this notion of juxtaposition in layout that can be so effective, I feel, in creating visual linkages to open up a broader discussion than what one simple, one single image can do. I thought I would close on just a few personal images from my life as a photographer. Fort Wayne, Indiana, 1972, on McClellan Street. When I first went to Paris, 1975. Paris. With Gorbachev in the Kremlin. Nelson Mandela with my brother David. Who's David? <laughs> when I left when I left Havana recently, I only then remembered that I had this photograph of myself with Castro and I I showed this picture to some of the personnel working at the airport just before I left and and I was amazed at the the emotion that seeing Castro because at that point Cubans hadn't seen him in public or on television for quite a while and I was amazed at the emotion that seeing him evoked and I realized the missed opportunity that I should have put this picture on my press pass and carried it <laughs> with Putin in the Kremlin you know as a, as a journalist, photographer, any of you that are involved in that, we all know that one of the real amazing things is, is how we have the opportunity to see up close and personal how people sometimes really are. And I was amazed Putin comes off in public always as being so, seemingly so powerful in his body language, and yet he's only about this tall. He's a very short guy, and he has a very childish-like laugh. This was 1988 in Algiers when the Palestinian National Congress um, first declared an independent Palestinian state. With Catherine Graham in Moscow, the then owner of the Newsweek and the Washington Post, during the Romanian Revolution. In Chechnya with good friend and colleague Chris Morris. The Zairean soldier on the Rwandan Zairean border, a Sudanese refugee, in rural China, at the White House, 
in Bosnia with my brother David on the right, in Iraq, 2003. This is when it all started. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because the photographs are so beautiful, but do you find that the digital thing, do you use digital? It looks that you can sort of, does it disappoint you or does it? Well, I use both film and digital camera technology today in my work life. Um, and I, I think I like both. Um, I will confess that I, I still love a, a silver print, uh, a silver black and white print. But digital technology, on the other hand, has been amazing in terms of the way that it can empower the individual to touch a lot of people. The, the rapidity with which one can share images with people around the world, um, the way that imagery can be archived, the way it can be represented by a photo agency like Corbus um, and, and literally have a world reach. Um, the way that one can, for example, coming over to London, uh, one can store one's life's work on a little external hard drive as, as opposed to having, you know, shelves and shelves of, of uh, analog work. Um, but I think more importantly than anything else is the opportunity to over the internet, uh, share one's work and really touch a lot of people. You know, something that may not be intuitive, but you know, you, just to think about is um, there's nothing more gratifying than being an individual and taking a photograph, which can be a fairly solitary process and pursuit. You know, photographers spend a lot of time out on the field on their own and by themselves. And there's nothing more gratifying after that expensive energy and care than to wake up in the morning and to receive an email from somebody across the world that would have seen your images on the internet and shared with you how they felt. And that happens to me all the time. And so I'm actually really grateful in many ways for digital technology. You, uh, my name is Philly. Um, you had said that when you were in high school you played a lot of sports and stuff like that until you had your injury. So then you made the decision to become a photographer. Uh, how did your fellow friends react that you sort of kind of went from sports figure, whatever, to this kind of polar opposite uh, direction? Well, thank you for that question. That's the first time anyone's ever asked me that question, that, as I know. Um, as I think about it, I think my friends and, and family and people around me responded really, really well because um, in many ways, I became a different person. I, I, until that point, the only way that I knew how to express myself was, was physically, uh, doing something well in sports. Um, in some ways, maybe even even though I love sports and I still today do, um, you know, the a whole sort of new me was able to open up. I, as opposed to only expressing myself physically, I began to be able to express myself in very subtle ways uh, and, and maybe sometimes rather soft ways. Um, and, and it was a, a side of myself that hadn't really come up particularly until then and it was very important to my own development. Um, and, and so I was very grateful not only for the opportunity to make pictures but just the way that my sense of the world changed. And um, I felt like I, you know, f from the very beginning, um, I felt so lucky to have found something that I was passionate about. Thanks. We'll take one more question. Hi, my name's Simon. Uh, have you ever, ever drawn a line under something that's really dangerous and you decided not to do it? Uh, and if so, what was the first time and, and did that change you? Well, I think that um, the, 
the kind of decision-making process of what one will do and what one won't do happens all the time. It happens in the midst of almost every in experience in the field and encounter with danger one has. Um, I, I think that I'm not a kamikaze, and I don't know any of my friends and colleagues that are. Um, uh, I, I try to make as well-researched and informed decisions as possible. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head any time when I decided something was just simply too dangerous. I have no sense of embarrassment to say that I feel like it's too dangerous to go to Iraq today. I, I could not do the kind of work that I would like to do in Iraq today as I know it. Um, I'm very, very uh, grateful and, um, and, and admirative of some of the fantastic work that some of my colleagues have done um, being embedded with military units in, in Iraq. Um, the work, for example, of Jim Noctwe, uh about wounded soldiers and the, the, the photo documentation of the, the role of medics and doctors um, is fantastic. Um, the kind of work that I would like to do today would probably, if I could, in my minds, in my heart, would be to really show how this war is affecting Iraqi people, and I just simply think that it's too dangerous, and, and I, 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 I'm not suicidal in that way. Um, on the other hand, I will say that I think any time uh, a photographer or a correspondent, I can only speak for myself, I think any time I've ever gone out the door and, got, and stepped on an airplane knowing that I was going to an area of conflict, that I took responsibility for the idea that maybe I wouldn't come back. Um, and I made a decision that, um, that something was important enough to me or, or that I was passionate enough about an a, opportunity to have a sense of purpose in my life, that I was willing to take a certain amount of risk. But make no mistake about it, um, I like life very much. And, uh, um, and, and I, I try to make as many informed and, and careful decisions as I can. Thanks. Thank you.